All right, so podcast number three overall. First with Trey, second time recording a podcast with Trey, because we did the, the Surge Trey Horse yeah. podcast, the yeah. STH podcast. But it's the first time we're just doing it solo. So welcome to the weight room again. Thank you. It's turned into kind of a recording studio. Because I really I think is. this is like the fifth podcast I've recorded in here. Because no one else uses it. So it's almost like our own so personal space. Where your, it's your own podcast domain. It is. Get, like a sign and stuff. Yeah. I mean, we have that custodian walk in once, but that was for real. Custodian. We should get a table. That's what we should get. The plyo, works well, the plyo boxes work fine. I guess, I guess you're right. So how did the, uh, <laughs> the 2012 group go today? Um, <laughs> was how old are they? 11. 11, yeah. So 2012, born in 2012. They're 11 year olds. There's. 20 something of them. Yeah. Um, you know, today I just wasn't feeling it. <laughs> I wasn't in the mood. They, so. It's like they simultaneously have so much energy and just so little interest in doing a lot of things. Well, it's like they have the interest, but the fact that there's 25 of them. They it's just, so distracting. Yeah, they feed off each other and they just scream the entire time. Like we played <laughs> handball for 35 minutes, I think. Yeah. And no one ever just sitting there, like, dude, I can't do this anymore. Because it's just like. Ball, ball, ball. Or like screaming someone's name the entire time. Yeah. And we were in like the arena, so it was super loud. Yeah. It's just you have to find ways to channel it because they have the energy, which is great. Like I'd rather I have know. a group with energy. Well, if so, I get them know. into like a smaller group of like, I'd say max maybe eight. Yeah. They do fine. Cause, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I got them to actually like start lifting weights. Yeah. But it was like a small group of eight, and like the rest mm-hmm. of them were like riding bikes or something like that. Sure. But like I think. I don't know how people control groups that big. Like that is absurd. <laughs> That's what I've been thinking about. Um, and we, we've talked about it before that these youth groups are by far the hardest groups to coach. Yeah, like props the, to anyone that does that. The pro groups are the pro and college groups are great. Yeah. It's so easy. You just you write it on the board and you say go, and then they go do it. And yeah. you, you maybe correct a couple forms, or you, or you count reps or something. But mm-hmm. it's so easy. Yeah, I mean that that makes sense. Like, I mean, they are professional college hockey yeah. players. And mm-hmm. It's much easier to communicate with someone that has a mature mind. Sure. Yeah. But even like some talking to some eleven year olds, like they understand, like common, they have common sense. Obviously, it's just being around twenty four of their other buddies <laughs> when we're trying to do like a goblet squat or something. It's just yeah, not. it's it, it's hard to channel that. I, yeah, with uh, with with the youth group, which are more like elementary school kids, like they're like yeah. fourth and fifth grade, so they're a little more, um, I don't know, they're a little more capable of functioning without purely being games. But I kind of just turned into only doing games. But yeah, also, I, I tried to like actually run sessions, and now I just gave both up. Both the youth group, it's not like all games. of them. It's not like they're a team, so they know every like mm-hmm. other people. So that's part of it. I think that's part of it. Is like they're on a team, so like they know each other so well that they all just. You know, kids are like pretty timid around yeah. people they don't know. At least for the most part. Yeah. But like today we did, uh, so we did we did some volleyball to warm up, and then we played capture the flag for a half hour, yeah. and that was great. They loved that game because yeah. they, they just sprint the whole time. And I'll, I'll throw out all the plyo boxes, like foam plyo boxes, so you can run into them full speed and you're fine. And they'll just they'll use them as barricades. I saw them like bulldozers, them as like shields. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So so they use and they'll end up just wrestling. Which is great, and then because if if I were to try to have them do that many sprints and and wrestle each other, they wouldn't do it. Yeah, that would be interesting. And so then and then we just did we did hungry hippo, uh, sprint relays, and that was great. Where they just did down and back sprints, yeah. grabbing cones from different positions, and yeah, and, and that was great. But before I would I would try to like I make everything try to be really competitive. Like if we're gonna do some upper body strength like push ups, you do like yeah. like a battle push up where you're like pushing on someone else or. Or like a grappling push-up, we're trying to pull their arms out, and it it didn't work. They weren't they didn't weren't interested in it. With, with high school or college guys, they they kind of understand what you're trying mm-hmm. to do, and so they'll kind of feed into it and at least try it. But with kids that young, it, it I I I feel like this summer at least it's it has to be completely a game. Yeah, you, a game you, of and five. you you can't you can't like trick them into doing things. Mm-hmm. Like you can't trick them into grappling by doing a push-up battle. You have to just create a super chaotic environment, yeah. and then eventually they'll just wrestle, and there you go. I think a part of it's like you have to create something that's super, super stimulating because a lot of kids are like overly stimulated sure. constantly yeah. on a phone, on a tablet, doing something. Mm-hmm. 
Like, I think they don't have the attention span to be like, okay, we're going to sit here and we're going to do push-ups, curls, so boring. pull-ups. For a lot of kids, it's boring. Yeah. For some kids, it's not. Um, I, I met up with one of my old hockey coaches a few weeks ago. Um, he coached me when I was in, in middle school, basically. And now he runs a summer training session for basically all-age hockey players. Mm. Um, and it's just this weekend session where he runs out of a park and he just brings uh, med balls and sleds and dumbbells to a park and just have – and it's super – open he basically sets up all the stations and then the kids show up and just go on their own time and do it all mm -hmm. and so the kids who are there um they'll be the same age they'll be, they'll be like probably 2012s there there'll be yeah. some kids like that but they are actually interested in training and so mm -hmm. they'll do they'll like show up and do that work and they'll just they'll do sled sprints because mm -hmm. they're that kind of kid but most kids aren't really like that most kids don't aren't yeah. interested in doing sled sprints I think you need to figure out some other way to make to have them do sprints yeah i think it's really impressive people that can coach and convey like a, a message to a bunch of 11 year olds sure especially in a large group but i mean specifically for me I'm not super interested in the coaching aspect maybe if i was like maybe more so your viewpoint mm -hmm. of like okay i love coaching this is what mm -hmm. i want to do maybe i'd be better or like more inclined to want to maybe try harder to like get something sure. done with the 2012s mm -hmm. um, i was going to say something else but sure no I, I was just thinking when, when i was that age I had sport coaches who would, would run great practices. Mm -hmm. Like I have memories of being in elementary school, and it be like I understand what was going on. We're mm -hmm. working on in hockey. We're working on a breakout or a regroup. Like doing that in like fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And I don't like how did they get a team of twenty yeah. kids to to do this? Mm -hmm. I don't know how. I don't know how I would do that now. If I had a group of twenty kids on the ice, I'd have no clue how to make how to have them understand a concept. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. Well, it's even like not even with like young kids like. You could go as far as to say any team of whatever age individuals, like for football, like my football coach would always preach about like buy-in. Mm -hmm. Like that's the hardest thing to do with like youth sports, high school sports, maybe even college sports. Regardless of the age, getting people to buy into like what the coach is saying, what he's preaching, what we're working on, mm -hmm. is like a really tough thing to do. And yeah. I think if you can figure out how to get your athletes to buy in, that's, that's great. Sure. Because that's yeah. obviously the end goal. If they if you if they understand what you're trying to do with them and they respect that, the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about our, our soccer game today as well. About what you, how how does so so today at at Velocity with our junior group, we're having a week long soccer tournament where before every session we play a soccer game. Where Trey and I drafted teams on like yesterday Monday, and for the whole week we'll just have a series and see whose team wins. And today we played for 40 minutes. We played for we played 40 minutes of soccer in pretty hot weather. Yeah. Um, before the workout with the with the group, and from your perspective, is that useful with the with a group of hockey athletes? Was that was that a useful use of time? I would say yes, because obviously it's a warm up. We need to get warm somehow. Um, it's the competitive aspect is great, but what's also kind of cool is how I mean, hockey and soccer aren't that different, so they're mm -hmm. kind of participating in the same sport obviously they're off ice yeah and they're using their feet so they're kind of like it's almost like a constraint of their own sport yeah like branching off of it like running around kicking a ball into a net so they're kind of getting exposed to the movement of hockey per se I don't know much about hockey but mm -hmm. it seems similar enough to where I think it's very effective and it's just it's just so fun yeah yeah so hockey and soccer were like my two big sports growing up hockey was bigger but I played enough soccer to mm -hmm. understand what was going on and when I'll hop in with like a Stavis team and just play five on five small area, uh, skill wise, I have no clue what to do. I, I can't control the ball. Yeah. I, I'm not good enough at that whatsoever. But the spacing and concepts make sense. Mm -hmm. the, the the way you attack and defend in terms of um, trying to create mismatches and two on ones and trying to control space, like that's all that's all the same. Is it's and I, I assume. I don't know. In football, it might be the same in terms of trying to create space. I mean, it's different somewhere. because, like, obviously, in, like, hockey, soccer, basketball, all those sports, I never really played any of those sports. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, like, even playing soccer, I don't really understand the concept of it's just the game is always going. There's not, like, sure. breaks. And, yeah. like, being able to know where you are in space. And, like, if I'm playing pickup basketball or soccer, for mm -hmm. example, like, I pass the ball. I'm like, I don't know what to do next. Sure. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. Like, mm -hmm. just, like, hover around the guy with the ball or just run over there. So I don't know. It's really interesting. Like in football, it's all like scripted, I guess, on offense. Sure. You know what you're gonna do. Defense, you basically just have an assignment. Yeah. But like, there's, so there's, there's really not much 
within a play creativity of like you, you almost are I mean, always def- following a route of what you're supposed to do. On offense, I would say there's like I wouldn't say there's like a direction like you're doing this. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's like plays. It's like okay, if this guy is over here, you're gonna run this route. If he's mm-hmm. right here, you're gonna run this route. But if he does this, you're gonna do this or whatever. Okay. And then I play defense. So it's just kind of, so you have like options of yeah. depending on what yeah, there can be options. Okay. And so like spe- specifically, I play defense, and mm-hmm. defense is just all reaction. So like say we call a concept, say I'm a high safety. Yeah. Like okay, if I get a run read, I'm gonna go down, and my job is to just contain this side and just force the ball back in. Okay. But with that, like, I could have, like, uh, a pass route come out to me while I'm running at that. I need to be able to, like, figure out, is that actually a threat? Is it a decoy? Is he running a route? Is he blocking? See, like, you have to see everything simultaneously. It's more, like, reactive. And there's definitely creativity because if you can't, you have to figure out how to weave your way through a bunch of people and ultimately Mm -hmm. get to the ball. But I would say soccer is more... I don't know. I don't know what word. I don't know about creative. It's just such a more. The game is just performed in more open space. It's just a yeah. more like free flowing game. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. How to yeah. Say it. No, that makes sense. Um, I, I again, I don't know much, know much about football, but when I played hockey, so I played defense, mm-hmm. and so <clears throat> I cared most about stopping people and yeah. like and not letting them score. And I would watch a lot of wide receiver versus cornerback highlights. Like I would go mm-hmm. on YouTube and watch like. Uh, Patrick Peterson versus Antonio Brown game highlights and just walk and there would be a YouTube video of mm-hmm. all the different like every time the ball was thrown to Antonio Brown be like what happened here yeah um, and that, I feel like that was so useful for me yeah and just watching the way that cornerbacks um, manipulate the, their opponent's hips and chest and w- what they're looking at mm-hmm. how they kind of bait spacing how they pretend to be beat in one spot but then actually gather the step mm-hmm. and recover and just watching such a, a one-on-one battle of a, con- a, a series of plays where maybe maybe you purposefully um, maybe you purposely make a bad play earlier on in the game mm-hmm. so that your opponent thinks you'll do that again mm-hmm. and then you pretend to do that you fake you come back you go the other way yeah um, just watching such a consistent one-on-one battle and then trying to translate the concepts I learned from that onto the ice because it's a team sport but there is still a very consistent one-on-one nature where yeah. a lot of times your team will match lines of you are always going out against the same. Uh, opponent, mm-hmm. um, and then you're always on the same side of the ice for the most part. So just say I get matched against the other team's line, and I'm playing on the left side of the defense. Their right forward will always be against me. Mm-hmm. I'll be going against the same guy the whole game yeah. for the most part. And so if, and so understanding if maybe earlier on in the game, if I'm taking one on one back and um, maybe I, I let him have the outside, mm-hmm. and I just I, I know he's going to have the outside, but I kind of just give him the corner and then try to ride him up on the boards and take the puck away that way. I maybe I know, or maybe I use that as a strategy for later on in the game. If I pretend to give him the outside, he cuts. I know he's going to cut. I take the outside away. I can step up the blue line and take the puck immediately. Like yeah. th- things like that, where if, if watching a really individual level sport like football can, or working, or maybe even playing it, like having hockey guys play three-on-three football. Mm-hmm. I, I do have that a lot. I have our hockey guys do that a ton. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because you're put into a one-on-one situation that's also integrated within a larger game where mm-hmm. it's, I mean, it's really a 3v3, but it's a one v it's a series of 1v1s within a 3v3. Yeah. And just doing that in a different environment, I just, it's such a useful tool for learning yeah. defensive. And I've even thought of like, like offensive strategies, mm-hmm. but offense is, I mean, the same, the same things could apply to offense as well. But just having different athletes, different Having athletes play different sports than their own can just expose them to so many different ways of trying to win back in their own sport. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I think I like going off like having like your soccer guys do like one v ones for football or like three v threes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like that's really uh, a great way to train, uh, train like change direction stuff. Like mm-hmm. a lot of people do change direction stuff. Like okay, I'm gonna do five ten five. I'm gonna do this L drill. And, mm-hmm. It's not really going to do much because mm-hmm. when do you ever do that on the ice, on the field, on the court, whatever. Sure. I mean, you're like using, you're learning to use your body in a creative manner to mm-hmm. manipulate someone else. And that's like the wildest thing. If you watch highlights of like Devin Hester, he's a kick returner mm-hmm. for the Bears. Sure. Like people like that, that just understand how to make people miss and how to use their own body to mimic others and then take that away and just like use it to their advantage is like massively important in any sports even if you're say you're a defenseman you need to be able to recognize that and obviously be able to not let someone like take your ankles or something sure. like the court. same thing with like a point guard in basketball or like a db 
But on the same side of that, you need to figure out how to manipulate others and do that for your own own gain. So it's like it's a two sw- two sided coin. That I think is really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, where to go from there? There's a lot of ways we could go. How about um? And so we kind of talked about velocity a little bit, like what we're doing for our work there, and that was kind of all of the the integrated agility and speed work side where we'll do. We'll do races for sprint work sometimes. We'll do any kind of game like that. Um, but what else, what else has kind of stood out to you at Velocity? Any, any like new training methods or mm. ideas or things that you, don't, you still don't really know? Like, like why do we do this exercise? Yeah, What's yeah, the point yeah. of this? Uh, I'd say the most blatantly obvious thing that's like new to me is just the amount of contrast. Because like sure. I understand what contrast tra- training is. I know what French contrast was. Um, but like in my own training, I never really did that much. I never went into like different training methods. I was just kind of like, okay, I want to lift heavy this session. I want to lift fast. I want to jump a little bit and I want to sprint. Yeah. And I never like thought of like the contrast, like is really cool. I think one, having sprinting in blocks is sick. Jumping so in blocks is yeah. sick. Like I some, having uh, like a bar, like a compound movement, a jump, a sprint, uh, a band accelerated movement, and then like a heavy movement or something all in one block is just mm-hmm. really cool to me because I've never trained like that or been exposed to anything like that. Um, another thing, I think a lot, a big thing is like learning how, like how stru- how you structure workouts. Mm-hmm. Like that's a big thing for me that I've been interested in that I don't really know much about is how to program how to. Like even just seeing your own programming, like for us, the coaches, like saying we have like, okay, we have a vertical, say it's like an upper speed day, we have like a horizontal speed block, we have a vertical block. Mm-hmm. Then we have like a pump or like a structure block of some sort, something like that. Those are probably been like the two biggest eye openers for me. Yeah, I think the, the point about contrast blocks and I mean, they're just turning the massive blocks. We have seven exercises in one. Um, a year ago, probably a year and a half ago when I first started at Velocity, I saw them doing that concept and I thought it was so stupid. Mm-hmm. I thought, why, why are you doing this? You're, you're, you're fatiguing the movement. You're like, if, if you do um, a, a heavy split squat and then a jump and then a sprint and then another jump and then another jump and another sprint, that's ridiculous. You're, yeah. you're gonna be so tired by the time you get to the seventh exercise, it's gonna be redundant and you're just creating unnecessary fatigue. Mm-hmm. And so that was, my, that was my perspective going in. And then I tried it a bit and I thought about it more and I realized I was really out of shape yeah, same. And, yeah. And I wasn't able to maintain high efforts. I, I, I would do one sprint <gasps> and I would just be tired. Like, yeah, yeah no wonder I thought that was stupid because yeah. I couldn't do it. And then you start training like that a little bit and you realize you can, your work capacity increases so much and not, not just your, um, not just your ability to kind of like maintain a steady state for a while, mm-hmm. but repeating a really high effort over mm-hmm. and over and over and hitting 15 fly 10s in a row where you're all at a good time yeah. or hitting um, maybe like 200 jumps in one session and they're all high effort and they're all, they all feel good. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's an ability that I just didn't have before I started training mm-hmm. that. Um, and then there's, there's, I'm sure that's still a good argument though um, that maybe you're not able to actually maintain your highest possible outputs, but you can, you can measure it if you have that yeah. technology. Like, well, like last Friday we were doing, we did, uh, we did 20 yard sprints within a block where we did a 10 second uh, like heavy step up for, for like fast reps for 10 seconds. Then we did 10 second single leg glute ham rebounds. And then we did 10 yard, or we did a 20 yard sprint with a, with a back 10 timed. And I got faster every set. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then after the sprint, it was uh, two jumps and an overcoming calf iso. And I got faster every set. Mm-hmm. I wasn't getting tired. I was getting better every set. And, and I couldn't have done that a year and a half ago. Yeah. I would have been exhausted. Yeah. I, would have been, I would have been falling over in the spring. Mm-hmm. But kind of the, the realization that you can get past that concern of minimal effective dose yeah. if you're just slightly able to maintain high levels of work, which takes a little bit of effort, and then you're there. Yeah, I think the, the minimal effective dose is kind of, it's a good idea, but it's also kind of stupid. I don't like it at all. I don't like it, because no. like, before I came here, my workouts, mm-hmm. say you have a seven, Say we have a three block workout and we have yeah. seven exercises in the first one, five or four or whatever in the second, third one. Like before I came here, I would, I would, I was always like, okay, minimal effective dose. I'm just going to do like the bare minimum because mm-hmm. that's like the best thing to do recovery wise. Sure. And I do, I do less than seven exercises in my whole workout. I do sure. like five exercises. I'm like, okay, I got a good workout. 
And that entire time, that, that five exercise workout would take me like an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. My heart rate would go up to like maybe 120 beats per minute and then just go down. Yeah. And maybe like 20% of that time, I'm in like zone two. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's really no capacity being worked on, I think. Mm -hmm. Cause like the first day we did one of your workouts, I was like, dude, I have not worked out like this ever. Yeah. Like, I think it's very beneficial, like sports wise, health wise, obviously, performance wise, like working out like that one, because you get exposed to a wide variety of stimulus, a mm -hmm. broad range of it, quite a bit of stimulus, but also like the cardiovascular aspect of, okay, instead of just going to the gym and training like an athlete, quote unquote, but actually just training like a power lifter kind of with some sure. jumps yeah. and then like, yeah, and yeah. then doing like tempo runs three times a week, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. Like just train with more intensity and mm -hmm. minimal effective dose is a pretty dumb concept. You're not gonna overtrain. <laughs> also, how do you know what the minimum effective dose yeah, is? Yeah, like there's not like a I don't, I like there's no not like a minimum effective dose calculator out yeah. there that you could use. I think one another motivating reason why I figured that out or like came to that kind of thought process is just thinking about what the soccer athletes mm -hmm. I worked with did. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like I would watch their practices. They're, they're running the whole yeah. time. They're, they're, they're running for two hours and frequently sprinting throughout. Mm -hmm. That is so much volume. Yeah. And, and when I did a sprint workout, it'd be like five 20 yard sprints. Yeah. That's nothing. Yeah. That is not, because part of it was. It's like a uh, warm up. Yeah. That's nothing. I, was, I think, so I was going to say, part of it is um, my, my, my earliest sprint, sprint training or speed training uh, impression. Uh, like my, my, what, what first informed me was kind of Tony Holler, Feed the Cats. Mm -hmm. It was that and then uh, this guy Clance Layler, who's a coach in York, Ontario. And both of their sprint um, philosophies were essentially minimum effective dose. Mm -hmm. you, you, do, you hit your top speed and then you're done. You, you do, a bit, essentially that you do five 20 yard sprints, like, like that's like Clance Layler's thing. Like mm -hmm. you, do, you do like three 10 yard sprints and then three 10 yard sprints with a sled and that's good. And then like you're done. And so like that's what I thought was ideal because you just touch your max output. You kind of like you hit what you can maximally do once or a few times and then you're done. You cut it off. And you don't yeah. want to like drain yourself because you want to be able to repeat that effort mm -hmm. consistently for a long period of time because it takes a while to improve. So you want to be able to hit that top output frequently for like multiple days, yeah. for months and years. And I trained like that for a long time. And part of it is I didn't start timing sprints until about um, maybe a, over a year and a half ago. So I don't know how that worked long term mm -hmm. um, because I probably that was how my sprints worked from tenth grade of high school until about a year and a half ago. Yeah, um, where I would just do a few sprints and then go and lift. And so I don't know how that worked honestly. Mm -hmm. I, I always felt like I was kind of fast compared to other people, but it was I have no idea. But then. I, that's how I sprinted for a while while timing sprints and I would time I'd do maybe like a few fly tens All right, cut it off. Good. Yeah, we're in a good spot and nothing really changed all that much for a while mm -hmm. um, Last summer I didn't really make a ton of improvement I, I think I dropped point point oh two off my fly ten over the whole summer mm -hmm. Which is something but it's not crazy and then I kind of changed directions after trying all that like, really high volume at velocity and started training with a ton of volume and basically doing how we're training now and everything got way better. Like, yeah. Jumping way higher, sprinting faster, lifting heavier, feeling better. Everything was mm -hmm. better. And I was, I think I was just severely under training myself. Oh yeah. For, for, sure. for, like, for a 20 year old guy mm -hmm. who is pretty healthy overall, I was severely under training myself. I yeah. was not stressing myself at all. Mm -hmm. Doing three sprints is not stressful. Yeah, playing a soccer game or a, a two-hour soccer practice and then going to the weight room and lifting after that's stressful mm -hmm. that's a lot of volume and it's amazing how much those soccer guys can handle yeah I I, I was able <laughs> I was able once in our off season to make them tired <laughs> the next day we would we would train n not exactly how like you and I have been training but but close with high intensity yeah. heavy weight a lot of sprints a lot of jumps and they come back the next day and they're like all right let's go we're good to go. They're, they're not, they're not sore. They, I would like, we're, we're, we're close. Like they're honest to me. There's no reason for them to like lie about that. Like, no, I'm fine coach. Yeah. I would ask like, are you like, how do you feel? Today? How do you feel today? You sore? No, I'm good. I feel good. We had done like, we had done, um, probably 10 max effort sprints. We had done 
probably 60 max effort jumps we had done maybe just say a, uh, a lot of volume on like heavy single leg squats the day before mm -hmm. like I'm good yeah like how it's amazing mm -hmm. what they could manage and part of that is because their sport is so aerobically stressful but also with so many high intensity bursts throughout yeah and when you're training like that when then when you try to and then you try to convert that to an off-season training program for them or maybe just my general training because I don't really have a season I just I don't I just yeah. train um, your outputs just just increase because you can repeat those high efforts so much so if you have if you understand that in order to change something it takes a lot of stress and work to actually force the body to change mm -hmm. and that's a great way to do it it's just yeah. high volume of high intensity and usually those two things kind of go um, like a seesaw like you can have high intensity with low volume or you can have high volume with low intensity yeah what if you did high intensity with high volume yeah it's it, it requires i mean then you kind of go back to like a tommy john pyramid thing where you have um, like your base of yeah, you human have, movement yeah. and then you have like your top output expression and yeah you just increase everything mm -hmm. like you do more sprints you do more lifts you do more jumps you do more isos you do more joint movements you do everything more and that that base supports those max outputs you can actually repeat a lot more now yeah. you, can, you can just do it more mm -hmm. and it just exponentially increases by I mean I was to a point but like at least what I've seen over the past year is Volume's good, and I was oh, yeah. I was scared of it for a while in terms of like uh, you could say more athletic outputs. Lifting volume was never scary, yeah, because that felt more controllable. I don't even know why, but I understood it more. It's like mm -hmm. this is strength, and strength makes me strong. Mm -hmm. I don't know what sprints are doing to me. It was more confusing. Yeah. I, didn't, I don't really know what sprints were doing to me in the past, so it was a little scary. Like, what if I do too many sprints? Yeah, I don't even know. Now I do too many sprints, and I get faster. Exactly. So yeah, I can understand that because. Obviously, coming here has really exposed me to the idea that I was definitely severely under training as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I wasn't doing high intensity, so I was low intensity. I wasn't doing that much volume, low volume. So, like, mm -hmm. I don't know where... I, I mean, I didn't really know much about training, but I don't know why I thought that would work. I mean, it, it seemed to work pretty well because I never... Only recently, probably, like, the last three years, gotten, like, super into training. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, I would go to the weight room and just do a squat do an RDL, maybe at four, three or four sets, do some jumps, uh, maybe do a lunge, do like two sets in Nordics and then leave. And then yeah. I'd be completely fine after my workout and I'd be like, okay, I, I think I did a lot. And obviously that's just not true. And I think, especially like in relation to sports, I was playing a sport right now, I want to be able to handle as much workload as possible. I want to yeah. be able to handle as much capacity as possible. I want to be as explosive as possible repeatedly as much as I possibly can um, yeah and I think train a lot I think a lot of people don't realize how hard you have to train to actually elicit an adaptation because mm -hmm. I don't think I know many people that actually train nearly hard enough for whatever they're trying to do sure because most people just go to the gym go through the motions I think we were talking about this with Mike yeah yeah we were talking about this with Mike like people go to the gym and think okay I'm gonna I want bigger biceps I want stronger biceps I want stronger arms I'm gonna I'm gonna curl this barbell uh, ten times for four sets, mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna do it. And like, don't think, I don't have a second thought about like their intention, uh, the feeling, like obviously progressively overloading it, uh, having any intensity whatsoever. And go to the gym for three months, and like, okay, why am I not mm -hmm. getting better? Yeah. And obviously that transfers to like college athletes. Like, there's a lot of college athletes that are very ignorant in the fact that they don't know anything about training. Mm -hmm. And they're doing these off-season strength and conditioning programs from their schools that are just like, like one of my one of my brother's friends. He's a quarterback. He goes to a school uh, around um, around where I live in Kansas. It's a D two school, um, and I saw his summer programming from their strength coach for the uh, the football athletes because he plays football there. It was like one day was squats. I think it was like ten eight eight six. Mm -hmm. Uh, RDLs, like sets of eight, something like that, step ups, and then maybe like a broad jump. And that was the day. Yeah. Like, that's just not preparing you for the sport. Maybe no. if you're no. so, like severely, severely undertrained and you have no lifting experience at all, you're just a really good athlete, just naturally. Obviously, that'd do something. It's better than nothing. But if you want to train a high performer, do, making them do four exercises that are just powerlifting workouts, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make you more explosive, faster, or anything like that. So I think, 
yeah, that's, that's all I had to say on that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what was the second thing you said? Cause you said you said contrast about velocity. You said contrast stats, and what was there's a second thing? Oh, structuring pro. It's like structuring programs. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah something that goes along with that. Um, Cause yeah, I mean that was what I asked you like, what do you want to get out of this summer? Like, mm-hmm. you have a few weeks left here, and yeah. what do you still want to do? And that was that was the main thing: um, writing programs and structuring them. Um, I would say I, what makes more sense to me is the day by day structure mm-hmm. of how do you schedule and how do you schedule Tuesday's workout, as opposed to like a months or year long program of yeah. In in April we start here, and next April yeah. I was thinking here. like more so like I have. I know like what a good split would be like what you're doing on Monday, what you're doing on Tuesday, like, yeah, a, a yeah. general idea. Mm-hmm. But going through like in an inv- individual workout, say Monday we're doing lower speed, yeah. like structuring that day. Mm-hmm. Like for example, say we do, say like it's like a Friday lift and we do yeah. pitch charge, uh, sprint, jumps, whatever, all in mm-hmm. that same block. Like why in your eyes, why would you program like an overcoming tap by so at the end of the block? Like does it really matter? Or is that just, like, you just want to do an overcoming calf I said. Yeah, yeah, so so for that one specifically, um, so I think a few things. One, it's just a generally good exercise. Yeah. It's a useful thing to increase your lower leg strength. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is, is that it's just easy, relatively. It's not, it doesn't take a ton of effort uh, compared to say a sprint mm-hmm. or, or a jump or something. So having it after a bunch of work just gives you some rest time in between. Um, so if you, if you want to maintain a little bit of a, basically just interval training where you're just kind of going um, without much breaks in between, just having active rest in between. So that's like with, with our hockey groups, that will we'll always have like hip mobility yeah. or ankle yeah, or, I like or, that or aspect spine or like, something, like one or two of those per block, kind of just to give them a minute where they just breathe. And yeah, and, and it's, still do something it, useful, yeah. but just kind of take some time in between the next set. And, then it, it, and that one specifically, so it was uh, it was like a barbell, a single leg barbell squat into a pin, but it was focusing on like the calf raise. So you're just kind of trying to push through your foot and drive your heel up the whole time. And that was, and then since that was in a block with jumps and sprints, I just I, it can also just kind of be a potentiation thing where you work on that lower leg producing maximal force, and then you go do something that requires maximal lower leg force. Yeah, and Maybe that helps out a little bit. Yeah. So, both those things. Yeah. It's like and if if I, if I were to be doing a more of an elastic grouping of exercises, maybe a hurdle hop and a single leg bound, and just th- things that are more like rhythmic and bouncy and elastic compared to high compressive, stressful weight, um, more like squatted movements. Um, if I were to be doing that more elastic block, I would probably program some kind of hip rotation work in it, just mm-hmm. because. Um, uh, for hurdle hops, for example, if you're doing like a bilateral hurdle hop, if you can get good rotation through your hips, um, so when you land, you get internal rotation through your hips, and then as you rebound out of that jump, your hips externally rotate and kind of express that force yeah. back up, um, that's useful. And so if in that block you have maybe that hip wiper movement where you go 10 second max internal rotation with your hip and then 10 second max external, and then you go 20 reps where you're just moving through that, mm-hmm. I think that's... Uh, that would be a useful pairing where you're actually trying to see a direct correlation between improving this isolated capacity and then seeing it expressed in more of an integrated uh, movement where you're, you're trying you're trying to access that uh, maybe that that, could, that uh, range of motion that you were yeah. just working on. So something like that where it's both a filler to catch your breath and reset and to get something useful in, but also in some form a potentiator or just like a, a complement to the primary exercise yeah. during that yeah, block. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, it, it just depends on what you're doing. Um, yeah, I found that also be really useful with, with sprints. Where I kind of, um, in, in the past when I would do sprints, it'd be, like in my, in my workout, it'd be, I would write five by 20 yard sprint again. And that would be a sprint workout. Mm-hmm. And now what I've, what I've been playing with more is doing a block of sprint training like we did at the tennis court that one day yeah. where it'd be well, you do a sprint that's A altitude drop B um, a fast jump maybe we, there was a hill right by that tennis court that we used so I don't know a 30 degree incline hill we're just doing fast jumps on and off um, for 10 seconds so sprint altitude drop fast jump 
And then you could throw something in, um, like like a rhythm bounce, yeah. like a, a pogo hop, or like a, a left right switching pogo hop, where you're trying to work more of the, the rhythmic and elastic and and bouncy side of it. So you have those three other movements along with the sprint, and the thinking is then you have a high impact, a high speed, kind of a rate, the the, the jump, yeah. and then more of a elastic rhythmic movement. All three of those concepts are useful in sprinting. Mm -hmm. And so you, having those paired with the sprint, maybe some of those qualities can kind of show up within the sprint and maybe um, improve it a little bit or, do, or just at least do it differently compared to doing 10 sprints in a row. You do sprint, drop, jump, bounce, and it's, it's just different. And then mm -hmm. when you go back to the sprint, you just, you're, you're in a different physical state than you would be in if you had just walked back from the sprint, sat down for two minutes and sprint again. Yeah, exactly. You're in a different spot. And so I just thought that to be useful. Um, and then just playing around with the, with what movements I'm pairing with sprints and just seeing how that affects them. Um, yeah. That was a great answer. Thank you. Where should we go from there? I don't Gr even... Ground beef. Ground beef. Yeah. Serge is not going to like this one. Oh, are we, are we stealing his thunder? We can, well. we can we save can it. No, we can save it. Because I think because he would like to talk about that. Um, I mean, I think nutrition is a good topic. We've, we've kind I'd, of I'd we've, we've kind of hammered training for how yeah, long? Yeah, I was going to say. So food. food, what do you think of it? Thoughts? Uh, eating is probably one of the best parts of my day. I agree, honestly. Um, some days it could be above training. Like I enjoy eating yeah. more than training, mm -hmm. and I hate that there's a stigma about like you shouldn't enjoy your food, or like who, who that thinks that? Skinny people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like people that say like it's an eating disorder to like want to have a meal or like or like people know. are like health freaks are like you should just eat for performance. Your that nutrition. was me in high school. I thought food. I, I was my my mantra was that food is numbers. Food is numbers. Yeah, that, that, that was you. You asked my parents like that's what I said about food in high school. I would just because I would eat. Did you track your food in high school? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Same. I had. A, I was religious about. We, it. we would have family dinner and I would have tuna and rice. Because. Food is numbers. I need I need this yeah. for tomorrow. Like, I think I off. went like, dude. I started tracking my food like freshman year of high school. Yeah. Just because I found like my fitness pal in the mm -hmm. app store. Me too. And then I stopped using it for a while. And then like junior year up until maybe f end of freshman year of college, I was weighing out every single thing I ate. Really. Tracking every single thing like every single day, eating relatively the same things. I'd go to like a restaurant. Say I was like with my brother and like my family, and I would just I wouldn't get anything at the restaurant. Like, I don't want this. Yeah, I'm gonna right. go home and have eggs or something. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. I mean, I still do that to an extent. I don't track my food because I don't care. Uh, I still eat basically any food I want because mm -hmm. within a, a scope of like a health lens. Yeah. But I'm not psychotic about it anymore. I'm mm -hmm. very happy I escaped that mindset. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I never got to the point of weighing food, but I just remember the realization where I would I would get to the end of the day, and I had eaten I don't know two thousand calories, mm -hmm. and my fitness pal told me if I wanted to build muscle, I needed like thirty six hundred calories per day, yeah. and so I just make the most ridiculous smoothie, I've the ever, most repulsive, and just chug it, yeah. chug it before bed. Do you ever um, take a mass gainer? No, I never did that, dude. It was I would so just bad. make I would just make ridiculous smoothies and, and bowls of oatmeal, power oatmeal. Yeah. So so smoothies. So I mean, this this, this is useful though. For someone who wants to build muscle, yeah. Um, so a, a great smoothie option. To Let's build share mass. smoothie recipes. Yeah, great for different goals. Okay, so first, um, I want to put on mass. So let's start with the the, uh, the smoothie. So I I like bananas. I think they just add a great consistency frozen to it. Or not. Frozen. I would always just have fresh, just because we didn't freeze bananas. Yeah. We just had them in the countertop. Yeah, that's how. So I put in a banana. I put in frozen mm -hmm. berries. Those are just for taste. Yeah, because there's there's no there's calories. I think of enough. it like a it's like a base or a structure for yeah, it. Yeah, because yeah. you want you want something cold and you want like you know you don't want to put like ice in your skin. yeah right right yeah so those two and then rolled oats I found were the best mm -hmm. um, form of oatmeal to put in quick oats and uh, and steel cut oats they're kind of chunky yeah yeah it's rolled, like rolled oats just dissolve so they're yeah. good a cup of rolled oats um, I would then use almond butter. I would probably I would just put a scoop of almond butter. You gotta be careful though, because it's so expensive. So you can't yeah. you can't get a lot of calories from it. Yeah. Uh, but some. I put almond butter in. I put coconut oil in. Coconut I was say, oil. That's a hack. That it is a hack. That's a, a, a hack. tablespoon is a hundred calories. Yeah. A tablespoon is not much. You could you could put five tablespoons in, 
and it would it would taste like coconut, but it wouldn't be that much. It'd no, be yeah. 500 calories though. Yeah. So coconut oil, um, a protein powder, sure, why not? Of course. A scoop or two even. Um, what am I missing? You could do honey and maple syrup just for some yeah. just some extra glucose, and then then you throw things in like nuts and seeds, pumpkin raw. like pumpkin seeds. Yeah. Um, any kind of a raw nut, a cashew, a walnut, those things are full of calories. Mm -hmm. So I'd put those in. Um, and then I, I would use water in high school, but you, using milk would probably uh, bolster your, your protein yeah. into, intake. So I think, and, and it tastes good. That, that one genuinely tastes good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll go through my, yeah, yeah. What, what do you, what my do you personal smoothie. I was talking to Serge about this today. Yeah. My goal for my smoothie is I enjoy smoothies and it's hard to get 270 grams of protein in a day. So I need something with protein powder in it and I don't want to just put protein powder in a shaker bottle and drink it. So we start with our base. We have nice frozen strawberries is like a go-to. I'll occasionally put blueberries in, but for the most part, it's frozen, stra frozen strawberries, <laughs> maybe like half a banana. Uh, a, two raw eggs will go mm. yolk only on one and then a whole egg on the other just to conserve space in our smoothie. <laughs> and then wait, yolk only? Yeah. No white? I'll do the I'll do the whole egg. I'll do one whole egg and, and then, then one, one yolk, yolk only. Because otherwise I don't have enough room. I have a very small You do have a small blender. I, I do. Okay, yeah, that's true. I need to upgrade. Yeah. Anyways, so we have the raw eggs, we have the fruit. Um, then I'll add in, just recently I started adding aloe vera juice just because it's really good for your gut. It's sure. like a huge antioxidant, easy way to get uh, some health benefits in there and it doesn't taste. Then I would add in some peanut butter powder, like some PB Fit, mm -hmm. uh, like extra protein and it just makes it mm -hmm. taste like peanut butter. Yeah. Um, then we're going to go chia seeds. Chia seeds are good for calories too. Like I put chia seeds in smoothies, yogurt, just an easy way Do to you get ever, um, What's it called? Where you like ferment them? Like chia pudding? Pudding, yeah. You yeah, I've that? never had that. It's no. good. Really? Yeah, oh, you just put it in in a milk overnight. Oh, really? And then they, they, they puff up and become really soft. And, Aren't they like and gelatinous? Like, yeah. Interesting. Just try it. I've thought about that. Yeah. Um, anyways, chia seeds, good source of fat, and it's really easy to get extra calories through that. Um, then like a scoop of protein powder, and I, I know what you forgot. Mm. Beetroot powder. Yes! Beetroot yes. powder is a game changer. Been doing that for a while. Yes. Big antioxidant. Makes your smoothie super red and pink. It's dope. It's unbelievable how effective of a food coloring it is. It really is. Why is Red 40 used? It shouldn't. Red 40 is is redundant if you have beetroot powder. It really is. I put it in my yogurt. Not even for the flavor, just so that it looks pink. Yeah. And then I have pink yogurt. I've put it in my water before. I put like salt and honey in my water. I'm like, might as well add beetroot powder. It makes yeah. it red. Yeah. Um, but yeah, beetroot powder is really good. I have no idea how much I put in, like, however much ends up on my spoon when I take sure. a big scoop out of my kilogram bag of beetroot powder. You have so much. Um, and so protein powder, beetroot powder, um, what's something else? And I usually put milk in it. Obviously, you don't need to put milk. I used to put almond milk in, and then I was like, why am I drinking almond milk? <laughs> Stupid. So then I put whole milk in it. Um, but you could, you could probably do water if you wanted. But I'm trying to find, so I'm trying to find something... I want to try cutting out dairy for a little bit mm. and because I feel like it gives me like skin issues like just acne specifically mm. and I don't have any like GI problems with it but trying to find a good smoothie like, I don't want to put water in my smoothie you try coconut milk that's a thing yeah <sighs> coconut milk it's great we're gonna have to do it's, and it, it's not like almond milk or soy milk where it's just a processed thing like coconut milk is a thing yeah it's just that yeah it's from the coconut Yes. Yeah. It's when you milk a coconut. And you I'd love to milk a coconut. I'm sure you could find it at a grocery store. I actually found at Fresh Time, mm -hmm. they had like a, co a coconut, maybe it was a coconut, I don't know, <laughs> with a straw in it that you could buy. <laughs> I was so close to buying it and bringing it to Barbenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Just sipping a coconut. I was like, this is either going to be really good or this is just going to be so bad. I decided not to. But yeah, I'll have to check out coconut uh, milk in a smoothie. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know another reason for drinking a smoothie other than you want to gain muscle, for like you want to get like adequate protein intake, or you want to bulk. Like, there's I, I, really not much of a reason, unless you like have trouble. If you have trouble eating like three full meals a day and getting enough calories in, that's the, that's the same thing. Yeah, that's the same thing. I've this past week I've had them for pre-workout, and I've loved it. 
I, mm -hmm. I'm just blending uh, frozen blueberries, bananas, uh, a scoop of protein, and honey and water. It's been excellent for pre-workout. Because mm -hmm. I'll have essentially that same thing as a pre-workout yeah. anyway. But blending it, it's, it's chewed for you. It was exactly. Sick. And I've really enjoyed it. Except yeah. Friday, it, Friday, I made too big of a smoothie. And I had a, a little too much smoothie <laughs> in my gut. As I don't as know, you PR'd. You PR'd. On Friday? Yeah. Did or was that, was that yesterday? That was yesterday. Oh, yeah. But I had a smoothie yesterday as well. Yeah. So it works. No, yeah, yesterday I had the right amount of smoothie. Mm -hmm. But on Friday, along with the fact that it was Capacity Friday, <laughs> the, the I had, gut bomb. I had a smoothie. little too much smoothie in me for yeah. Capacity Friday. <laughs> yeah. I think, what was I going to say with that? I don't even know where I was. Just give me a sec. Sure. I genuinely don't know what I was going to say. Yeah. So continue if you must. Yeah. Oh, um, instead of pre-workout, I always go smoothie pro post-workout just because it just mm -hmm. tastes good. Yeah. It does. Obviously, you want to get protein because I don't feel usually after a workout like the last thing I want to do is go home, go through this laborious process of cooking rice, nice. cooking beef. Yes. Like no, I just want to. I just want to ingest calories as soon as possible. I guess a way we could begin to wrap up is. Where does your training go from here? When you go back to Kansas, what are you going to do? That's a great question because I have no idea. Yeah. I haven't thought about it. That's probably something I need to think about, but I'm not super worried about. Mm -hmm. um, that depends on a multitude of things that I don't know what I'm doing during yeah. the fall. Sure. I could be playing sports. I could not. Um, if I end up playing football, I think, I, I mean, I'm going to be in complete control of a lot of the yeah. stuff I'd be doing, which is unfortunate. Not to say that what I would be doing is bad or uh, – not effective, but a lot of the stuff in like the college world, especially co like collegiate sports, is pretty closed-minded and pretty basic for the most part. Um, obviously, I could do other stuff on my own, so I'd have to figure out how to uh, simultaneously like do college workouts and also implement things that I think are missing, which I think would be really cool. Like yeah, be good, looking good at something task. like okay, I'm doing a bunch of strength and speed work here, but I don't get really any mobility or like impulse stuff elastic stuff stuff mm -hmm. like that yeah um if i don't end up playing football i'd probably i don't know i think i just need i think i'm gonna try to formulate my own structure programming that like fits within what my goals are like i want to be strong i want to play i want to be fast i want to be athletic um i want to move well i want to be able to do really cool stuff and I think like blending a lot of the stuff that we've done this summer, like your ideology of training with like what I've done, because like a lot of like specifically the sprint work, like you're focused on being fast and like I, I want to be fast. Mm -hmm. And then like blending that with like the sprint work that I usually do with like the constraint based, like yeah. solve a problem, react to something, then run. And then like mixing that with like the super structured, like methodic way of actually trying to increase speed using like that circuits or yeah. whatever, like the... Uh, contrast training things like that mm -hmm. I think blending like blending something like that would probably what I'll end up doing if it comes to that but yeah I'm excited honestly because I mean you know how it is like writing like a program for a week and like the week say you write a program on Sunday you're like okay you write all this stuff down and like comes Monday like you're super excited mm -hmm. it's like I would always enjoy like having a new workout to do I'd be super stoked to do it mm -hmm. especially when it's, if it's something you've never done before so I'll, I'll play around with that and we'll have to see what I come up with so I'm excited yeah, me too. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see what you come up with because that is that that's the that's the fun part is trying to blend different ideas together. Yeah. That's what I'll try to kind of do with with this group here mm -hmm. of uh, of college guys, of of try to blend the the structured uh, like method of training of isolating parts and looking at say a sprint or an athletic movement and seeing what movements or positions are common through there and then trying to improve those movements or positions mm -hmm. taking that side and then blending with blending it with the chaotic reactive uncontrollable side of sports where maybe it, and it's in a, a specific example of a, of a sprint session where you have that method circuit of try of, of the different uh, methods of sprinting the the impact those the speed and the movement and the uh, like the rhythmic side and you have that, but then you also can find a way to integrate um, misdirection and change of direction and, 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 and faking and more of the mental side and finding ways to integrate those two together. So yeah, that's, that's where we kind of go from here, Exciting. I think, is just applying it all. Yeah, that's great. Cool.
Well, thanks, man. Good talk. Appreciate it. Yeah, we'll do it again.